um, 20 minutes talk, five minutes question, please. Okay, thanks. Um, so thanks a lot for the invitation to talk here. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about a bunch of papers with uh, my student, Jenny Weiss, who really taught me a lot of what I needed to know for this. Um, and three postdocs, Gautier Durier, who's now at CERN, Tepe Kitahara, who's in Nagoya now, and uh, Camila Machado, who's a DAISY. So the idea here is to develop an on-shell approach to uh, EFTs, uh, that is EFT effective theory extensions of the standard model. And I, there are gonna be mainly two, two main themes uh, throughout. Uh, one is that uh, I'm gonna, I wanna develop and, and show you some toolbox for EFT computations um, on shell. And the other one is to get some sort of on shell understanding of electroweak symmetry breaking and the Higgs mechanism and how does uh, SU2 times U1 emerge uh, in this uh, on shell story. And since we're doing a completely bottom up approach and some sort of bootstrap approach, uh, you can use this to explore all sorts of uh, EFT extensions of the standard model, uh, whether they're weakly or strongly coupled um, and, and try to say something about them. So um, I'm gonna skip the outline in the interest of time. And before going into any details, I wanted to show you uh, broadly the current uh, toolbox that we have for handling these uh, massive EFT amplitudes. So um, the, the things that we have so far are general, oops, I'm sorry, general three and four point amplitudes for both massive and massless particles of varying spins. Uh, in particular for the electroweak sector, namely spin zero, one half and one, um, we uh, have a bunch of results that uh, are needed for computing these amplitudes. Uh, a, de a detailed gluing prescription of gluing together uh, massive amplitudes. Uh, we have bases for all the massive three points and bases for all the massive four points, uh, including essentially going to any dimension. Uh, and these include both bases that are appropriate to describe generic amplitudes and just the contact terms. And there's also a matching to the broken phase uh, standard model EFT. Um, beyond the electroweak theory, there are also bases for all massive three points with spins up to three and uh, some more results for massless particles. Okay, so uh, there's been a lot of activity on effective field theories recently, uh, both from a theoretical point of view and also experimental point of view. Uh, and if, in some sense, this is a bit sad because it's really reflecting uh, our ignorance about uh, what lies beyond the standard model, uh, what's the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking and the attendant naturalness problem. There are no clues from the LHC. So uh, these bottom-up EFTs are essentially a great way to uh, quantify our ignorance uh, and parameterize deviations from the standard model. So in the usual uh, Lagrangian approach to EFTs, the input are the standard model fields uh, possibly some uh, new particles or some new fields if you're interested in um, studying them. Uh, the symmetry, the standard model symmetry, both the global and gauge symmetry, and of course, Lorentz and locality. And uh, out of this comes the EFT Lagrangian with uh, some number of operators divided by uh, some, <clears throat> some UV scale. So a bottom-up bootstrap approach is very natural for this problem. Uh, in this case, the input are the standard model particles and possibly again, some uh, new particles. The symmetry, in this case, the global symmetry, the gauge symmetry would emerge if you uh, do everything consistently. And of course, Lorentz and locality and uh, outcome the most general amplitudes. So starting with three point amplitudes and gluing these into higher point and higher order amplitudes, uh, you essentially uh, can construct the most general amplitudes. 
So uh, this is really nice because the first step of an EFT construction is to identify the basis of uh, operators. Uh, so you need a basis that's complete and independent, uh, module all sorts of field redefinitions, um, use of the equations of motion, uh, gauge redundancies. And mathematically, this boils down to the problem of uh, finding a set of polynomials of operators that are subject to a set of uh, constraints. In the QFT case, this was uh, solved very nicely using uh, Hilbert series methods. But uh, in the on-shell construction, this becomes uh, very simple. So when you do things on-shell, you only deal with physical quantities. So uh, you completely circumvent uh, field redefinitions and gauge redundancies and things like that. Uh, and instead of having to find polynomials of operators subject to a set of constraints, uh, this problem really maps to uh, simple polynomials in the metal-stem invariants. So just uh, regular polynomials sub subject to a set of uh, kinematical constraints like uh, S plus T plus U equals the sum of the masses squared. And as a byproduct of this, you get a counting and classification of EFT operators. So uh, beyond this, for standard model applications, you typically start from the full uh, EFT Lagrangian. Uh, once, electric, once you include uh, electric symmetry breaking, then uh, these operators modify all the masses and standard model couplings uh, that you know, and so you need to redefine your input parameters. Uh, in an on-shell construction, you just relate physical observables, which are directly measurable. And so uh, this has a chance of uh, uh, providing a simpler framework for doing this. Okay, so then the question is, how on-shell do you want to be? Or uh, one way to ask this is, can you be half on-shell? And in this case, the answer is yes. You can work uh, in the unbroken electroweak symmetry. You can work with unbroken electroweak symmetry uh, and impose the full SU2 times U1 uh, symmetry and work with just massless particles. Uh, and of course, this is very useful because it's a good approximation at high energies. Uh, this is really all you care about if you're interested in running and anomalous dimensions. Uh, and there are many powerful results uh, in this um, in this framework, but the focus here is going to be fully on on-shell massive particles, the actual uh, massive particles of the standard model. And we want to exploit the full power of uh, this on-shell approach to relate physical observables ultimately. Okay, so let me uh, mention very quickly some basics. Um, so the little group uh, is basically going to give a set of selec selection rules uh, and together with the spin statistics determine all the endpoint contact terms, uh, starting from three point contact terms to higher ones. The remaining parts of the amplitudes are determined by factorization or generalized unitarity. Uh, and so essentially you can bootstrap uh, uh, higher point amplitudes by gluing together lower point amplitudes and adding uh, the counter terms. So you first want to derive three point amplitudes, then get the four points by gluing two three points and adding four point contact terms. Uh, and uh, there is a one to one correspondence between these contact terms and EFT operators. And the unknown coefficients that uh, come in front of these contact terms correspond to the unknown Wilson coefficients. And of course, the first thing we need here is the uh, to find the full set of uh, contact terms. Okay, now in order to write massive amplitudes, what we use uh, is this really nice uh, little group covariant massive formalism, uh, where you decompose a massive momentum in terms of two massless momenta, um, where n the SU2, the massive SU2 little group rotates between um, these two. Um, and so, I'm, I'm sorry, it rotates between the, those, the spinners associated with them. So uh, pi, p carries the index i um, <clears throat> that takes uh, values one and two. Uh, and this is how the SU2 uh, acts on the angle and square spinners. 
And essentially, if you have an external leg of spin S, uh, the amplitude carries uh, two S uh, indices that are symmetrized. And essentially, you're constructing a spin S representation as a symmetry combination of uh, spin one half representations. Um, the, um, it, it's nice to simplify the notation here by using the bold notation. Uh, so bolded uh, spinners mean that you are symmetrizing over the little group indices. For example, uh, these bolded P's here mean that these I and J uh, indices are symmetrized. And I'll use uh, bold face also for massive momenta just to distinguish them from the massless ones. Okay, so at the end of the day, my amplitudes are gonna be expressed in terms of spinner products that are bolded uh, possibly with momentum insertions um, inside. The thing that's really nice about this is that it's very easy to take the high energy limit. It basically corresponds to bolding, to taking the bolded amplitudes and unbolding them. So what this really amounts to is your massive momentum is given by these P1 and P2. Uh, choosing the direction of P1 is amounts to choosing the uh, direction of the spin polarization axis. And in order to recover helicity states uh, or helicity amplitudes, we want to take P1 to coincide with the massless limit of P. So then, for example, for a vector of positive polarization, I and J equals one, uh, this guy uh, just goes to the unfolded version and any other combination uh, vanishes. Okay, so let's uh, put this to work. Um, so let me give you one simple example of how you can parameterize uh, the EFT amplitude for a vector and three gluons, where this vector is a standard model singlet. Um, and it's very easy to see that you can parameterize the amplitude up to very high dimensions. Uh, here I'm taking all plus helicities for the gluon and working to dimension 12. So uh, this is the form of the amplitude. There is a part that's proportional to DABC and a part that's proportional to FABC. Uh, the little group determines the structure of these uh, spinner structures uh, in red here. And the coefficients are polynomials in the invariant subject to the usual constraint. Uh, and you just need to impose uh, symmetry or anti-symmetry and you get these things up to very high order. Now you can also unbold this and recover the massless amplitudes that make up uh, this uh, massive amplitude. <coughs> okay, so um, as I said, the first thing that we uh, need here are bases for uh, the amplitudes and bases for the contact terms. Um, and uh, we want to write these uh, bases in terms of uh, massive spinner structures. And when I say a spinner structure, I mean something that doesn't have any prefactors of the Lorentz invariant. So um, um, these are uh, some examples. Uh, you see that we can have just uh, a spinner product or something with a, an insertion of uh, one or more momenta, but no, um, no, no invariants outside. Okay. Um, this paper by uh, Arkani Hamed and Huang and Huang uh, gave bases for all the uh, massive three points, uh, but these bases are overcomplete in some cases. So one thing that we've done is to derive uh, the independent basis for all the three point uh, amplitudes for spins up to three. Um, and then the next thing you wanna do is you want to uh, get bases for amplitudes that are four points and higher. Um, and there are different types of bases of interest here. So the simplest sort of basis you can think about is what we call the spinner structure basis. So that's just the minimal set of spinner structures that you need to spin a generic amplitude. The number of uh, the elements in this basis is just uh, the product of two S plus one for each one of the external legs. Um, and of course, this is something that in principle, you could do working in terms of the usual polarizations, but here we want to do this in terms of these massive 
uh, spinner variables. So um, we'll denote the spinner structure by SI, where this I denotes all the little group indices. And in order to discuss uh, independence um, and, and, and differentiate between independent and dependent structures, um, it's convenient to construct an inner product of uh, two structures. Uh, and this inner product is given by some function of the Mendelstam invariance. So um, turns out that it's very easy to construct the spinner structure basis by starting with the massless basis and bolding. Um, getting the massless basis is very easy because you're just talking about um, the usual massless helicity amplitudes. Uh, and so essentially what you can do here is to classify the different spinner structures according to their helicity categories, namely the helicities of the high energy limits uh, or unbolded versions. Then in the massless limit, uh, spinner structures of different helicities have uh, zero inner products, so they're independent. And so you're saturating uh, the set of uh, structures that you need uh, and bolding, starting with the massless amplitudes and just bolding them gives you the massive basis. And of course, the reason this works is that uh, what this bolding really does is to covariantize the amplitudes with respect to the massive little group. Okay. Are four minutes left. Okay, thanks. So uh, we actually uh, want to spend uh, just the contact terms for EFT purposes. So we want to manifest the local form. Uh, for that, we need a larger set, but uh, I'm not gonna have uh, time to uh, go that in detail, but it's something that we derive. And this is the full set of uh, uh, spinner of uh, this is the full set of the bases that you need to spend the electric uh, amplitudes. Okay, so let me show you some uh, examples of electric uh, amplitudes, and I'm not gonna have time to go through them, but um, I'll, I'll go through some. So one of the couplings that's most essential here is the uh, coupling of three gauge bosons, the three electric gauge bosons, uh, which are nearly degenerate. So uh, one thing that we can do for starters it, is to think about what we can learn about this coupling, uh, neglecting, first of all, the mass difference between them. Um, so the most general amplitude that you can write in this case is given here. Um, and if you look at, uh, at these structures, you see that this is completely anti-symmetric. So you need a prefactor that's completely anti-symmetric. Uh, and therefore, the only thing that can appear here is epsilon ABC. So you see that the SU2 structure emerges uh, in this case. Similarly, if you had N degenerate particles, you would get not epsilon ABC, but some completely anti-symmetric tensor. So uh, you see that the full, you are starting to see the legal structure. Of course, to go and see the full structure, you need to uh, consider the factorizations of four point amplitudes but uh, it's easy to see this at the level of these massive amplitudes where things are completely symmetric between uh, the different uh, spin one particles. Okay, you can also see how electromagnetic charge conservation follows from this uh, amplitude. And in order to see the full SU2 times U1 structure emerge, uh, you can consider the high energy limit and uh, consider both the WWZ and the WW photon uh, amplitude. Okay, I differentiated here between renormalizable and non-renormalizable couplings. So in some cases, I'm, renorm I'm uh, putting MW squared uh, in the bottom, and in other cases, I'm uh, putting a lambda bar squared. Uh, and this is basically coming from looking at the high energy limit of this amplitude. So uh, this structure scales like m squared e. So uh, it's renormalizable. It has a smooth limit if we have a one over m squared normalization. Uh, this, structure, this structure goes like e cubed uh, and therefore needs to come with a one over lambda, lambda uh, squared normalization. 
So essentially what this boils down to is that we're uh, using uh, the high energy behavior uh, or perturbative unitarity, order E terms are good, order E squared terms are bad uh, because essentially E squared behavior would give you um, a four point amplitude that's not consistent with perturbative unitarity. Um, another way to think about this is that you want a smooth behavior as m goes to zero, so e over m is bad, but e over lambda bar is okay. Okay, um, so I'm not going to go um, in detail through these examples. Uh, let me just show you uh, quickly another one. You can also look at the four-point function involving two fermions, a z and a Higgs, uh, and this has both a contact term piece and a factorizable piece. And if you look at the high energy behavior of this, uh, this is uh, what it does. So you see that if you want a smooth uh, limit uh, as m goes to zero, uh, you have two options. Uh, either this term vanishes, either this factor vanishes. So for a vector like fermion, gl equals gr, uh, and that's it, there are no other constraints. Uh, however, for a chiral fermion, GL uh, is different from GR, uh, and then you need this factor to vanish. So for a chiral fermion, uh, the fermion mass is related to the Z mass up to uh, this ratio of couplings, which is essentially the Yukawa divided by the gauge coupling. Okay, so Essentially, by looking at the high energy behavior of these amplitudes, we can recover everything we know and love about the standard model and about electroweak symmetry breaking. Okay, um, so um, I'll conclude here. Um, the, this on-shell approach is very natural for constructing bottom-up uh, EFT extensions of the standard model. Um, you get compact analytic expressions for all the for the amplitudes. Um, it's very easy to see that uh, it's very easy to go to very high orders in the uh, invariance, which corresponds to the derivative expansion. Uh, on the other hand, you're summing the v over lambda terms to all orders. Uh, these are included in the spinner terms. And you can also see how this SU2 times U1 structure and Higgs mechanism uh, emerge from this, uh, from the properties of these uh, amplitudes. Okay, so um, I think I'm gonna leave you with this uh, since this is the start of the uh, holiday season. So um, I'm, I, I don't expect you to uh, go through this table, but you can just uh, uh, see that you have the full set of uh, three-point uh, amplitudes for spin up to three here. So thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any uh, questions or comments? Uh, I have a question, but I couldn't find the uh, raise hand. Can I ask? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for the talk. I have a question about the high energy limit. I'm wondering if we take a high energy limit for, for, a, for a massive particle, and we expect that, for example, for a massive graviton, we expect that in high energy, uh, the vector and the scalar mode uh, vanish. If uh, it, uh, they don't vanish, can we claim that we don't have a UV completion for that or not? I mean, if we don't have a, a smooth high energy limit in this approach, can we claim that we don't have a UV completion? So I, I didn't understand why you expect them to vanish. I mean, you, you expect them to unify in some sense. I mean, if you have, if you're looking at a, an amplitude with a, with a massive vector uh, and you have a smooth UV and, 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 and you have some UV completion, yeah. then you expect them both to unify, to come from something with a scalar and something with a massless vector, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, that's, and that's what you will see. 
I mean, you'll see that the massive vector amplitude uh, in the high energy limit, it for zero polarization vector, it coincides with the massless amplitude where the vector is replaced by a scalar and the transverse part coincides with a transverse massless vector. Thank you. Ben? Hey, Yael, thanks for that nice talk. One of the things you skipped over on the previous transparency, but I saw it while it was there, was massive recursion. So if you're thinking of like BCFW recursion, I think the first thing you need to do is identify some complex shift that preserves the massive on-shell relations. Right, so is yeah. There I'm thinking... any, I mean, is that known or, or what's the status of that? So um, for some reason, let's see, something happened to my... Anyway, I just said massive recursion. <laughs> There's not right, much. Right, right, right. No, yeah. I, I. Oh, there you go. To... There's some more there in the back. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I. But uh, I don't have I don't have any backup uh, for massive recursions. I think it's a very interesting uh, problem. Uh, there's been some work, uh, both by uh, Okirov and Franken and Schwinn, on uh, massive recursions, and um, and and I. I, I think it's an interesting, I, I think there could be perhaps uh, some more to do, um, maybe something that would preserve this uh, more, more of the, uh, maybe something that would be somewhat nicer from the point yeah, of view of- The Franken and Schwinn one wasn't very little group friendly, right? Exactly, If I remember right. right. Yeah. Right, yeah. Hello. So, maybe I can, I can help with that sure. a little bit. Uh, yeah, well, in my paper that's cited, I only use the massless shift, but since then there have been indeed uh, by Frank and Schwinn and by other authors, some uh, little group covariantizations of the known shifts uh, from, from the mid 2000s, uh, where you shift one massive and one massless particles and you are allowed to do that. And you, you, you were allowed to do that Back in the 2000s, you're allowed to do that now. Now you just have nicer formulas that are little group covariant. So it's it's re really no problem. The problematic part is sometimes to prove that uh, you have a boundary behavior that's vanishing uh, to get the recursion working well. Hi, can I make a comment? Please. Yeah, so. Is that connected? Um, the problem is only if you have just massive particles, then uh, you you have a problem of maintaining the things in this covariant form. Um, if you have at least one massless particle, then you can define the, the shift to maintain this massive little group in a covariant way, and there is no problem. So I work at the, I have a work with Adam Kolkowski, and we basically can do a BCFW um, and a soft shift soft shift and we just you just need one one soft particle all the other particles in the um, scattering can be massive so then there is no problem okay thank you um there was a question also then by paolo bikini uh, yes thank you uh thank you for the talk i i had a question about um your comment of how you found the basis uh, where you just look at the massless case and then bold the spinners. So, I mean, sometimes you have some massive spinner structures that can like vanish in the massless limit. So I was wondering how are you, how can we in general be sure those don't give extra structures? I don't know if you understand yeah, what I mean. Yeah, for sure. No, this is something that we, uh, th this is something that we had to worry about. Absolutely. Um, so, of course, you have to be a little. You have to be a little careful when you do that. I mean, you need to find the the massless. You, you need to make sure that you are starting with uh, things that are non vanishing in the in the massless case. And and so it's not it's not that every choice that you are making it will will give you the right thing. So you need to. Uh, you, you need to be careful about this. Th this is certainly an issue. I mean, you have uh, 
it's exactly as you say, you, you have some things that can just vanish in the master's case. But I mean, is it like always true at like, I, I don't know, all order that, that, I mean, those structures can, I, I mean, can you always find a basis just in terms of things that don't vanish in the master's case? Like how general is so, the statement? Right, so that's a good question. I don't have a completely general answer to that. Okay. I mean, it happened for the, it's true for all the four point amplitudes um, featuring the spins that I, going between um, zero to one, essentially. Okay. Um, and, and one thing that I should stress is that we don't have a systematic way of uh, doing this for um, higher point amplitudes. Okay, thanks very much. And I think it's an interesting problem. I mean, um, it would be nice to have a, a systematic way. And the one thing that I didn't show you at all is the, um, I just talked about the basis for the contact for the most generic amplitudes. I didn't talk about uh, basis for the contact terms. These are, not as easy to get. I mean, you can still rely a lot on the messless case, but uh, it doesn't go through that easily. Uh, and and you, in general, you need to worry about all sorts of identities where some of these identities or, or many of these identities have clear analogs in the messless case. But again, it's not something that I know how to do for endpoint amplitudes completely algorithmically. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you. I see no more questions. So let's uh, thank Yael again and all the speakers of this first session. And we have, as per the schedule, we have an hour break.